did uh, a little bit on angular momentum on Monday. We're going to step back to uh, just the business we needed to do for linear momentum. Uh, that's all that's going to apply here. We're going to look at impact and collision. Make it the right color chalk. We're going to look at impact and collision. So we did a little bit of that in um, in physics one, as most of the stuff has been. But we're going to, of course, look at it in greater depth. For the simplest kind of collisions uh, we can look at, we might look at a solid, immovable, incredibly massive barrier into which will run uh, one of these objects, these type of things that we throw around, in particular moving at some velocity and it has some mass. And it's going to hit that barrier and then rebound with some other velocity. Uh, sort of the tradition in, in these impact type things is we tend to put a little prime mark on those things that happen after the impact, after the collision. I'm not real fond of it. If you're not careful with that, it starts to look like a uh, like a, a, a superscript or an exponent. So be careful with it. Uh, there are places where we actually have to square those, so you have B prime squared. If you don't write it carefully, as with an awful lot of the other stuff we write, uh, if you don't write it carefully, it's not going to show uh, show what you need it to show. So to figure out something about the change in velocity for that object, because uh, it's not in any way necessarily true that V equals V prime in magnitude. In fact, in real collisions, and you know this from any time you've done this very type of collision of dropping a uh, tennis ball or a golf ball on the floor, that never comes back up to the same height, which you would have to do uh, if it had the same velocity going in, the same speed going in as the speed it had coming out. So um, we can figure out something about the uh, uh, change in momentum. Uh, we might want to make this a vector equation where, in this case, we could get by with just pluses and minuses there. But uh, uh, we have that on the uh, right-hand side, the momentum side of the impulse momentum equation. This is the momentum of the whatever the object is itself. Of course, the momentum of the wall uh, is essentially zero because it doesn't have any change in velocity. But this momentum is caused by the impulse that the ball receives due to some force exerted on it by the wall itself. And this is, this is over uh, whatever period of time is that part of the collision. And these are typically, uh, as you can imagine, very, very short collision times, often then very, very high forces applied. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of study that goes on looking at these, and they're typically kind of big things where they, they occur in tenths, if not even a hundredths of a second. What we'll usually do is not look at the peak force or the entire integral, but we'll use an average force to represent that. However, uh, it's tough to know what those forces are. There is not, uh, there's not really any way you can calculate. We can calculate what the average force is because we can figure out uh, something about the, the uh, change in velocity, if we have some idea what this time period is. But that's very quick, too. And so uh, if we really want to know some of the details here, just what the impulse was, the area under the curve, to get the average, we're going to need some kind of experimental data of some kind to uh, be able to finish that.
However, uh, very shortly we're going to see how we'll get rid of that entirely. Since these forces and these times are difficult to know, well, John could do it with some of his gizmo. If we could do it if we drop your uh, laptop. We could do a little test that way. Sure. Bounce it I'll off the floor. Um, well, great. Maybe we'll just uh, we'll all chip in and do that as a little lab experiment. All right. But we'll, we're going to be done with those forces uh, shortly anyway, just because uh, they're, hard, they're hard to determine. You need some very good experimental uh, equipment to um, determine it. So we're going to have basically two types of collisions. Uh, a direct central impact that's where we have two objects both circular, originally heading towards each other. Now, those are relative velocities. It could be that one is still and the other is moving with a great enough velocity. All we care about is they have some relative motion towards each other. There's an impact and then there's relative motion uh, after collision between the two. The instant they collide, our coordinate system is defined at, those, at that moment. Once they collide, we've got the original path direction and perpendicular to that, and that's true with the geometry and for our definition, at the uh, interface of contact, we have our other coordinate direction defined at that time. So. Uh, we'll call this the normal direction and that the tangential direction. Tangent to the two objects themselves, the surfaces of the two objects, uh, and orthogonally uh, defined instantaneously uh, upon uh, impact between the two. So we'll look at those in some detail. Uh, we'll also use uh, a subscript notation to uh, delineate the two velocities between each other of the two objects. And then after collision and rebound, whatever they might do, then we'll use also this prime notation. So they'll come in at each other with V1 and V2, collide, rebound with V1 prime and V2 prime. And remember, these may be relative velocities. All we're concerned with is that they're moving to, towards each other uh, for an initial collision. The only other collision we'll look at is that of an oblique central impact. Direct meant simply that uh, the centers of mass of the two objects are following along the same path and that uh, that path is also defined uh, during the, or at the moment of collision by that normal direction. Oblique central impacts are those where the objects are coming in at some angle with some speed such that those are not collinear. So oblique refers to the nature of approach of the two. However, just as before, as these come in, at some instant in time, they'll be in contact during the impact <coughs> And at that moment, then, is defined our coordinate system, and all angles are in reference to that coordinate system. So we'll have approach velocities with magnitude and direction. We'll have initial approach angles, and we'll use our our subscript to uh, designate 
one of the two of them. And then there'll be some velocity after collision that we designate with a prime, and we do the same thing with the angles. So this would be theta one prime, that's the angle of the first object after collision, and we'd have theta, theta two prime there. And we'll look at uh, uh, both of those in some detail. The, the deal with these being central collisions is uh, by definition taken care of by the fact that these are circular objects that are hitting. So that the instant they're in contact, their centers of mass are both right on the um, normal axis. So that's the nature of the central impact. It's mostly the direct and the oblique that we need to uh, separate what we've got here. And then there are other impacts that can be looked at that are not central impacts where the objects are of different sizes and shapes, but we're not going to go into to the, the detail needed from those. We're just going to spend one day on these. All right, so we'll step through a direct central impact in some detail and use that to sort of set things up for us. As we, uh, as we go through these. So we have two objects moving with independent velocities and could be in any direction, but uh, ne it's necessary, of course, that V2 be, or V1 be greater than V2, otherwise they'll never impact. So we're, we don't want to study non-impact impacts kind of boring. So we have V1 with a great enough velocity such that it overtakes V2. And uh, this, is, this is just the setup. This is the, uh, the before collision. Period. And we only need to be a, a, a split second before that to be able to set up the, uh, the early part of the problem. Sometime later, V1 is caught up to V2, and they're now in some kind of contact with each other, where there's enough of a force between them to uh, between the two that there's actually a deformation phase where the objects themselves are actually deformed. At this instant, they're moving with some common velocity because they're in contact, they're essentially one object Some little bit of time later, usually very small, they are then in still in contact, but now they're trying to restore their deformed shape. We're using essentially elastic uh, materials, and at least somewhat elastic, and pool balls and and. Uh, Automobiles all have some nature of this, where they're still moving with some common velocity, but now they're trying to restore their shapes, and it's actually this restoration that pushes them apart as they try to reform to their original shapes. This takes place in some very, very short period of time, after which they're now restored to their original shape, 
they each have some subsequent velocity and uh, I'll draw them like that where, where uh, typically V2 then now is departing from V1 with uh, its greater velocity. So we have those four phases before collision, deformation, restoration. Uh, this is known as the morning after. Joey, okay. sometimes followed by uh, uh, embarrassment, maybe, maybe, maybe they smoke a cigarette. All right, what we're interested in then, of course, is this collision period there because that's what sets everything up. We assume that the velocities are constant, so we don't care anything about this. What we need to look at is the impact itself. And during this very, very short collision period, the velocities might change significantly. Uh, could certainly be that one is coming in, is moving to the right after the collision, is moving to the left, or vice versa. So that can be a significant change in the velocity. We're going to assume that during this time, the position changes very little. It's such a short period of time that even at this common velocity, which usually is not, uh, uh, might not be all that great. If we have two, two pool balls coming in towards each other, the common velocity could actually be zero, and then the position change would be almost nothing. And then we'll also neglect friction, and that means any slipping of the surfaces of the, the two objects over each other, as might happen uh, in either imperfect direct collisions or in any oblique collision, collect, collisions anyway. Uh, we'll also overlook other non-impulsive forces. those forces that don't contribute to the impulse side of the impulse momentum equation. And uh, if you remember, those were external type forces. What this means for us then is the momentum of the system is conserved. If there are no impulsive forces, there's no impulse to the side of that side of the equation, and thus the impulse, the momentum of the system is conserved. So we can use our, our prime notation on that. All right, so that will help us solve some of it. It won't help us solve all of what's going on, so we need to bring in some other parts here, especially as we start to look at the oblique collisions. Uh, they're a little bit more involved because more is going on. We have more unknowns. We're going to need more equations, if nothing else. So we're going to focus now on this deformation and restoration phase. during deformation. That's where everything's going on. That's where we're going to need to focus to figure out what the deal is that's going on. So let's look at one of the objects. So 
Here it comes in. It's colliding now with that other one because of some very large force, uh, deforming force, due to its collision with the other piece, uh, the other object in the problem. So this will be M1. It was moving with some velocity, V1, but at this instant is moving with the common velocity of the two as a as a as a single unit, a single system. So the impulse this one receives, of course, will be that deformation force for however much time it acts, which is, uh, we'll call it on the order of delta T over 2. Half of the phase is deformation, the other half is the restoration. The only other thing we need uh, to tidy this up is the, the force is opposing this common velocity, so there'll be a minus sign in there. And that will tell us then what the change in momentum of this first object would be. Which we can make a little simpler. It's M1 times B1 prime minus B1, the original B1. Oh, sorry, not B, not B1 prime, let's see, uh, VC. That's its... It comes in with velocity V1. It acquires velocity VC during the collision. So that's the before and after speed set. about this over here. We don't know what there is to integrate. We don't know what the average velocity is. We don't necessarily know what that delta T is. Um, that's part of the problem there. So we're going to have to address that. So after that, it, it goes into the reformation phase where it reforms to its original, I think I called that restoration, not reformation. Restoration. Restoration. I like that word. That's what happened here. Restoration. All right. The object is trying to go from its deformed state back to its original state in rebound. So it might look something like this, where it's still moving with the common velocity of the two. I do that the wrong side. That's object two. This is object one we're looking at. Still moving with some common velocity. And still receiving some kind of force. It's trying to restore its original shape. It's pushing off on the second object, so it's the second object pushing back on it. So it still looks like that and in the same direction. And the integral of impulse momentum is going to still look very much the same, only we have this restoration force rather than a deformation force. And there's nothing to say that those should be equal. And so this will be the change in momentum of object one after the, or in the second half of the collision where it now acquires its new rebound speed after having gone into the restoration phase 
with this uh, combined velocity that it started with. Restoration impulse divided by the deformation impulse. That way we can compare the two. In a lot of the things we looked at in physics one, those two would have been equal. Therefore, the momentum was perfectly conserved in a perfectly elastic collisions. That's just the case we'd have. But in more realistic collisions, we need to look at other parts of it. So we have this restoration impulse divided by this deformation impulse. Both of those integrated over the uh, approximately the same time periods, but it's easier to work with the momentums. So we have the change in momentum after Im impact divided by the change in momentum before impact. I guess since we're only dealing with one here, we want one zone as well. But we've got more detail on those too since we have these velocities. So this would be <coughs> V1 prime minus Vc over Vc minus V1. Where the m's cancel, the masses cancel, because it's the same mass of, of the uh, same object. <coughs> be too big a stretch to see that if we did the same analysis for the other object, we'd get exactly the same kind of thing. This force is coming from the second object, and so if we look at the second object, we're going to see this very same force, same magnitude, just directed in the other way. And so we would also then go through the second object and get V2 prime minus Vc over Vc minus V2. And since the forces are the same, since they're equal and opposite pairs, the time they're in contact, of course, is the same because uh, one is in contact with two at the same amount of time. These two impulses are the same. These two are definitely then equal. It's not, uh, not necessarily even an approximation we're making. Anybody see a obvious trouble <coughs> with this though? trouble is, what in the world is Vc? V1 and V2 and V1 prime and V2 prime are very easy to get. We could have done, in fact, we did, if we did the linear air track in physics 1, which I think I did with some of you, maybe I didn't do that with anybody in this class where we used the linear air track. It's very easy to get those 
the velocities of the individual objects before and after a collision, but it's very difficult to know what the velocity is during collision. So we need to eliminate that somehow, which is fine, because we don't really care about it. So with a little bit of algebra, you should be able to come up with this. We can combine these so that the coefficient of restitution is defined as the opposite of V2 prime minus V1 prime over V2 minus V1. Or if you remember, we had a notation for relative velocities. We can write V2 slash V1 prime over V2 slash V1. <coughs> and those can be quite easily measured um, and are not a, a great experimental difficulty. So this coefficient of restitution. depends on the two materials. No great surprise. Uh, how a tennis ball, two tennis balls would bounce off each other would be very different than how a tennis ball and a golf ball would bounce off each other. Experimentally determined only. You cannot give me two different materials, two different balls, and I can't come up with what the coefficient of restitution would be. I have to run a test, like, just like friction was, if you remember. And then uh, for a perfectly elastic impact, that energy is conserved in those types of collisions. Both objects have a, an initial kinetic energy, both have a final kinetic energy. In a perfectly elastic collision, the, there's no loss in energy between the two. A perfectly inelastic collision, this is the one like uh, would happen if one of the objects was a lump of clay and they stuck together then, became one single object. So, I don't know if we should call that perfectly inelastic or imperfectly inelastic. But in that case, we have a relative velocity between the two of zero in the numerator, and then of course E is zero itself. No relative velocity between the two after collision because they stick together in a perfectly inelastic collision. And in this case, the change in kinetic energy is a maximum. It's not all lost because there's still quite possible that they're moving after the collision and there would still be some residual kinetic energy, but that's the maximum amount that's lost during collision. All right, so let's do a quick sample problem just to uh, warm up with it, to get used to a using that. So imagine an uh, object there, two pounds, dropped from a height of of uh, six feet onto a 10 pound plate that's sitting immovably on the floor.
to find out what the coefficient of restitution would be for this uh, ball on that plate, whatever those materials are. Remember, it depends upon the two materials. We do this test and measure the rebound height of the uh, ball. So it drops from six, but then rebounds, and we'll say it rebounds to five feet. So we'll drop it from six feet, measure how far it rebounds, and from that we can get the coefficient of restitution for these two objects. Remember what we're concerned with is the velocities just before impact and just after impact. Those we can get assuming uh, free fall and neglecting air resistance, we can find those two velocities. If this is object one and this is object two, V1 we can get from simple free fall analysis. Uh, you can use the work energy equation, you can just use F equals MA constant well, acceleration. And you, you'd be able to come up with, that just comes from one of the constant acceleration equations, that uh, V1 is uh, dependent upon the height from which it was dropped. So that's this part here. V2, the speed of the plate before collision is zero. It's not moving, it's just sitting there on the floor. V1 prime then we get from the rebound height GH prime and V2 prime is still zero. And so we can get the coefficient of restitution from the two of those. So I want you to go through that just because there's a tricky little bit in it if you're not careful. V2 prime minus V1 prime over V2 minus V1. The minus sign allows us to keep those subscripts in the same order. And for us in this problem, V2 and V2 prime are zero. just to make sure you get something right on it. The, the one tricky little part in it, just want to make sure you get You got it, David?
guess it just depends now. You get down to a point where you, who wants to be here for student for the weekend? Tom doesn't. No. What do we got? We're getting some disagreement here. You feel okay? Yeah. So you can get over your uh, key. All right. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's see. We're not agreeing. What did you get for uh, V1? Negative 19.6. And that's feet per second, I assume. And for V1 prime, not the same sign on those. Remember, this all came from the change in momentum, which means we have to take into account direction. So we have to know that those two are in opposite directions. Um, so we get minus. Uh, v1 prime, but there's another minus sign there. Units are the same, so they'll just cancel. Then we have a minus here, and another minus there, so that's a minus, a minus, 19.6. That's four total minuses, so it's a positive number. Something like uh, 0.91 or 92, something like that, but a positive number. Coefficient of restitution is a positive number. Most uh, coefficients like these in science are meant to be positive. Um, sometimes they artificially add a negative sign to produce that, but in this case, uh, when you solve for coefficient of restitution of eliminating the constant velocity. It comes out that way anyway uh, and allows you to keep these in the same order. 2 minus 1, 2 minus 1, which is just a lot less chance of a mistake. All right. Same problem with a slight change to it. Same problem. Drop it from the same height onto the same plate. So two pound ball dropped from six feet onto a ten pound plate. However, the ten pound plate is on uh, shocks. So, now we've already tested the plate. We know what the coefficient of restitution is between the ball and the plate. Just because there's springs on here doesn't mean that changes. It's dependent upon the two materials, but not dependent upon what the materials are doing themselves. So the coefficient of restitution remains the same. Still dropping it from six feet. With this information, we should be able to estimate the rebound height of the ball. How many unknowns now? Because we're going to need that many equations. How many unknowns? We know the coefficient of restitution because we've run that test. That involves the velocities. Two approach velocity, two, two before collision velocities, two after collision velocities. The before collision velocity of the ball 
is not going to change. It's still the six foot drop with that ball. So that's known. What about before collision velocity of the plate? It's also known. It's just sitting there. Nothing's happening to it. After collision, we don't know the rebound velocity. There's no reason it should be the same as this. In fact, it couldn't be because some of the momentum of the ball is going to transfer to that of the plate. So there's going to be a after collision velocity of the plate. So we have two unknowns. But right now we only have that one equation. Uh, v, v, the plate is two, so before collision the plate's not moving. So coefficient of restitution is known. V1, V1 is known, because that's no different. We don't know either of those two velocities. So we need another equation. Go to equation.com, get out your credit card. That'd be awesome. Download, immediate download, if you're on the internet. God, that'd be great. Sure be easy to be an undergraduate student if that was the case. What's our other equation? What? Did I hear something? Does it have anything to do with some of the halls? Huh? Does it have anything to do with springs? Uh, you think it might, but notice I haven't even given you the spring constant. Now, sometimes I forget to give you stuff until later in the problem, but not this time. It has to do with the collision itself, and it's, in fact, an equation I've already given you. Wait, does it have to do with conservation? Yeah, the momentum is conserved. There are no outside forces. Uh, there are no outside non-impulsive forces. Yeah, gravity is an outside force, uh, but it's, not an, it's an impulsive force, not a non-impulsive force, or conservative, non-conservative, if you wish. So the... Momentum of the system will be conserved. So we can use that as our next part of the equation. So let's see. The uh, mass of 1, V1. There's the momentum of the ball just before collision. With the momentum of the plate just before collision. But of course the plate's not moving. It has no momentum. And they're both going to have some velocity after collision and thus some momentum after collision. And we don't know either of those. So we have two equations and two unknowns now. It's just algebra left. I don't expect you to go through it. So. V1 prime turns out to be, well, it was 17.9. Is it going to be greater than, less than, or equal to that this time with this plate on Springer's? It's going to be less. It's, it's, it's no different than if you uh, drop this onto, a, if, you know, if you did this test onto a board on the floor, and then put the board on your bed and dropped it. It's just not going to rebound as high. You, you know that. So its rebound velocity is minus 6.3 feet per second. If, if down is positive, up is negative. Uh, I guess we did the opposite of that over there. So sticking with that, I'll put take the minus sign off. And after velocity, or after collision, the plate is actually moving down with, uh, hang on, I got those reversed. The ball is 11.7, the plate is the minus 6.3. So my minus sign is okay, it's, the plate's moving down.
now that we have this uh, 11.7, we can then figure out the rebound height. It comes out to be something like uh, uh, something just under two feet. So it had rebounded to five, now it rebounded to something under two. Notice, though, it doesn't matter what the spring constants are, which is interesting. I don't think that's obvious from the start, but it's immaterial. It would certainly affect how far that plate rebounded, but its initial velocity, the instant after collision, is independent of the springs and spring constants themselves. All right, any questions before we move on to the oblique central impacts? All right, things are a little bit different. We can use a lot of what we just came up with in the oblique central impacts. We just can't use it all. And we'll see why in a second. So we have two objects moving obliquely at each other with some initial velocities such that they'll collide. They do so and at the instant of contact might look something like that which defines our coordinate directions from which we measure the angles. So we have V1 coming in at theta 1, V2 coming in at theta 2. They collide and they rebound in some direction. V1 prime and V2 prime. At some angle, theta 1 prime and theta 2 prime. So let's assume this much. Assume that uh, the masses are known. In fact, are we even going to take them to be equal? Um, not necessarily. No, but they're known. Uh, now, of course, once we establish everything, we can we can do other things later in the problems where maybe those aren't known, but all the other stuff is. Uh, the uh, before collision velocities are also known. And since these depend upon the directions, they have to be known as full vectors. And we'll assume that coefficient of restitution is also known that whatever these objects are in collision, we've gone through the test where we let them go through a direct central collision, and from that we calculate the coefficient of restitution. Once we've got that for those two materials, we don't need to do it again. How many unknowns now? I heard two, I heard three. Do I hear three and a half? I hear four. I hear three or four. Six. Six, why not? There's four. We don't know the magnitude or direction of either of the velocities after collision. 
So we don't know the magnitude or the angles, or we don't know the two components in that uh, coordinate system. Either way, we don't know enough, but we, in fact, we don't know anything about the after collision vectors. Four unknowns, V1 prime as a vector, V2 prime as a vector, and that's four unknowns. Whether you do it magnitude and direction, or whether you do it as N component and T component. Either way, we don't know two of those. So we need four equations. One of the equations is already known. It's the coefficient of restitution equation. Uh, however, <coughs> there's uh, a fairly obvious concern with that, I hope. In that this is not a vector equation. So these are not the vectors. It's not even the magnitudes. What we have to do is realize that this only applies for the velocity components in the normal direction. So we only use the normal components in those in those uh, calculations. Why is that? David? Because the change in momentum is happening. They don't collide in, against each other in the tangential direction. They only collide on at each other in the normal direction. So we only have that normal component uh, as we apply it to it. So if you if it's helpful, make sure that the ends might even be on the individual velocity components uh, parts themselves. What's a, another equation we could use? David? I'm thinking the tangential component of V1 and V2. Right? Well, right. Uh, there's even a more obvious one than that. So let's do that one first, and then we'll dig a little deeper. The momentum of the system is conserved. Uh, that's not going to help us in the tangential direction, so we need to apply it in the normal direction to get any useful information out of it. In the tangential direction, there are no forces in the tangential direction, so there's not going to be any change in momentum in the normal direct, uh, tangential direction. Um, tangential momentum is identically zero. Not, not, not the tangent. The change in tangential momentum is identically zero. The momentums aren't zero, but the change in tangential momentum is identically zero. There are no forces. No, no. There are no forces in the tangential direction. So there's no change in momentum in the tangential direction. The, the tangential impulse is zero, so the tangential change in momentum is zero. So that's no help to us. We have to look at it in the normal direction anyway. So we have to set this up. So it would be m1 v1 in the normal direction plus m2 v2 in the normal direction equals m1 v1 prime normal and m2 v2 prime normal. So it's 
normal direction only because the tangential direction is not going to give us any information. You calculate the change in mom tangential momentum, you're going to get, let's see, uh, delta G, no, let's see. Uh, G tangential before is identically equal to D tangential after. So you're just not going to get it. And they're both, both, uh, I don't know how to put it. Uh, the change in is identically zero. Uh, blah, blah, blah. They, they couldn't be anything else but equal. So there's just nothing we can get out of that. So that's why we have to do these in the normal direction only. Because there's normal forces only. <coughs> so there's uh, the two magnitudes in the normal direction and the two magnitudes in the normal direction. We don't have anything about the tangential direction though. We need that to get the full vector flavor of those two after collision vectors. We can get the normal components of those two vectors with these. We can't get the tangential components with those two. So what are we going to do? What, what, uh, what could possibly work? Well, this one's not quite as obvious. The tangential points don't change. Sorry? They don't change. Yeah, the tangential yeah. momentum for each individually is conserved. This was for the system in the normal direction. For the individual pieces in the tangential direction, momentum is also conserved. In fact, uh, when you do that, the masses will cancel, and that shows exactly what Chris just said, that V1 in the tangential direction is equal to V1 prime in the tangential direction. So those are the easiest ones, and it also applies for the second object as well. There are no tangential forces on the balls individually, as well as collectively, which we just used. And so there's our four equations and four unknowns. If we, if we took a look at just the, uh, see these two here, these also mean that E in the tangential direction is identically zero, which is why we have to use the norm, normal components over here. So. Uh, there's no sense uh, looking at the coefficient of restitution in the tangential direction. It's identically zero. All right, I think we need a problem to take us into the weekend. All right. So here's what's known for this problem. And then you have to figure out what's unknown. Two objects of the same mass, just as you would do if you were playing pool. Um, v1 is 30 feet per second. At 30 degrees. That's theta 1. So I guess that's the back. V2 is 40 feet per second at 60 degrees. Nice round number. 
numbers like always appears in nature? Never have any decimal values in real life. And coefficient of restitution, 0.9. Four unknowns. Some of them are very easy to use and you can finish in just seconds. Others of them take a, a little bit of time to go through. Particularly those two tangential equations. Uh, figure out the tangential velocity components, and you know those don't change. So somebody should volunteer to do those, take the rest of the day off. And that will take us into the weekend. things a bit, makes it a little bit easier. If you want to do the two easy ones first, just to get warmed up, I don't blame you. Just come up with the four unknown component directions, and that'll suffice. That'll completely define the after collision velocity vectors. Tangential momentums is conserved. That's easy. We can do these in any order. I don't have to do them in the order I listed. Tangential components of both 
are concerned, and it's a matter of doing the trick to figure out what those are. 34, 6. For the second one. Okay, that's just the tangential components. And those are the same. Say what? set up now two equations for the two last unknowns, the normal components, and that's the system momentum is conserved in the normal direction. It's conserved too in the tangential direction. That's not useful to us in finding an analysis. <coughs> and then use the coefficient of restitution. in the normal direction because that's the only direction in which we have any collision. It's the uh, normal components that make them collide. The tangential components don't make them collide. That whole thing? No.
All right. I'm in a good mood. I'll give them to you. V2, well then don't look. V2 normal prime, V1 normal prime. All right, let's see, V1 normal prime, yeah, it's negative. Minus 17 seconds. If you didn't want to hear that answer, don't look. If you don't want to hear this answer, don't look either. 23 seven. But I won't tell you the units, that way you won't know what to write down. All right. As long as you set the equations up, it's just algebra that's left, and that's not the point of our class here. We've got to get the physics right, not necessarily uh, the, the algebra just sometimes takes a little time. So. Okay.